welcome to the Butler Gallery. Thanks very much for turning up earlier today for uh, our artist talk, which we usually have as a lunchtime event. But um, uh, Eamon O'Kane, who was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland, lives in Denmark, in Odense, and also in Bergen, in Norway, where he's a professor of uh, visual arts and painting yep. at the Bergen Academy of Art and Design. Um, and so this is always a lovely opportunity to have the artists talk you through the show and give a little bit of background of their practice. But we usually start with, with asking the artist and Eamon to maybe fill us in a little bit on your background as an artist, your practice, and what led you to this body of work. Because it, it, it incorporates a few elements of your work. And we're so lucky to see these beautiful drawings and installation and a film and video installation from you as well. So it really covers uh, quite a, a, a big um, arc of your practice. So I'll let you have a start and then we'll, we'll have a chance to ask questions. We're going to stay in this room. We're not going to move through because as you can see it's a little, uh, we don't want to upset the install. So we'll, uh, Amy will talk us through the rooms um, in this room and <coughs> we have an opportunity to ask questions as well. So Amy, thank you. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, first I'd just like to say thank you all for, for turning up today and also thank you to Anna for inviting me to, to do the show here and to Barbara and to Eilish, Evan and Steve for an amazing install week. Uh, we've had a couple of ups and downs but mostly ups and it's been really, really uh, fantastically professional team to work with. So. Um, Really, really good, and uh, I'm delighted to, to come back here actually because um, I did a show here in uh, well 17 years ago in 2000. Uh, it was um, an exhibition that was uh, a result of uh, my research uh, uh, funded by the Tony Malley Award for Painters, and uh, it's just really kind of magical to, to come back to a space where you've exhibited before and to in a way look at yourself in the mirror and see where you've come since that time or maybe where I haven't come since that time or how, how similar uh, things look or how different things look. So there's, there's been, the, through the, the few days here I've been here installing, there's been a lot of reminiscing and, uh, and perhaps a sort of semi-nostalgic way but also kind of going over my, my practice in a different, different ways as well. Um, I, uh, as Anna said, I, I was born in, in Belfast, but I uh, uh, grew up in County Donegal, uh, and just outside um, a, place, a place called Lifford, which some people might be familiar with, which is just on the border. Uh, very close to a little village called uh, Ballandrate, which in Gaelic would be Ballinadrachid, the town of the bridge. Um, and uh, the house I grew up in um, is a historic house. Uh, my, my parents, um, uh, got it when I was uh, a little baby and they were both school teachers and uh, they moved in to this massive old old mansion and their, their belongings didn't even fill up one of the rooms in the house. Uh, and they had come from a kind of a, a pensioner's bungalow in Strabane uh, where they couldn't even get my pram in the front door so they were kind of uh, in that sort of situation um, to start off with. And I think they had to draw water from the well at the start and the various different things. But this this house, or the growing up in this place, is really the, the kind of core of where my artwork is coming from. And it's also a bit uh, connected to how I find myself interested in uh, some of the background to, to this body of work. Um, uh, especially uh, the uh, pedagogue, Friedrich Freubel, who was the inventor of the, the kindergarten. So he invented the kindergarten and established the first kindergarten in Germany in 1840. But he was originally trained as a crystallographer. Um, and uh, obviously because he invented the kin kindergarten, he wasn't a kindergarten child himself. Uh, but he had uh, uh, been brought up in the, in the countryside in, in Germany, in the forests. And I think my childhood, uh, having sort of 10 acres of of uh, forest and, and, and sort of gardens to, to roam about in and to, to sort of build camps and, and have different adventures. That, that sort of fed my, um, uh, my imagination but also uh, formed the basis of, of how I approach uh, different creative processes. Um, so that, I think that's one of the reasons why I was attracted to Friedrich Freubel. Um, there's a lot of undercurrents in the show uh, 
that refer to other works. So I currently have a show on at uh, Dreyacht in Blanchard's Town, uh, which is the uh, is a, the Freudel Studio, which is an interactive uh, exhibition uh, that's been shown a lot in in, uh, in Ireland, and uh, I I change it every time. But uh, the, this actual exhibition has parallels with that. So in um, Gallery, uh, the, the one beside us here, Gallery 3, um, the, uh, these structures themselves are inspired by uh, the type of wooden objects that Friedrich Freudel would have uh, studied as a crystallographer in Berlin in the 1800s. So the crystallographers would have had um, a kind of a, a toolbox of different crystals that were uh, kind of carved out of, uh, of, of those wooden objects uh, uh, so that they, they could analyze and study the, the formations. Uh, and I'm also very interested in, in uh, crystallography because it's an interdisciplinary science that was kind of um, uh, sort of seen uh, as a lower science by uh, the scientists of the time. Uh, because it, it didn't sort of fit into these uh, other, other categories. And because of that, it became a space where um, both genders could collaborate and occupy. It wasn't a kind of patriarchal structure uh, like the, the other sciences were. Uh, and that's also very connected to Friedrich Freudel's uh, experience of, of inventing the, the kindergarten, it was because he uh, was very much uh, influenced by women's handicrafts and also by, uh, well, very much by nature as well. I mean, he looked at the sort of building blocks of nature and uh, used that as the basis uh, for his uh, pedagogy as well as having studied with Pestalozzi. And uh, he um, uh, then uh, invented these uh, 20 uh, gifts, which are from the Freudel uh, game which uh, are the sort of, uh, along with the garden part of the kindergarten, they're very much part of his uh, uh, idea around, uh, around the whole kindergarten. And uh, uh, it, it had the consequence that after, I guess, about 13 years of the kindergarten being established in, in Germany, it was, actually, it was banned by the German authorities uh, because it was seen to be um, too anarchic um, and the patriarchal structure at the time uh, meant that children were uh, forced to learn. They were sort of, you could even see sort of examples of furniture where they're almost like electric chair with neck braces where the, the children are sort of sitting in these and forced to look at the blackboard. And Freudel was undermining all of those, uh, all of those things um, and as a consequence it got banned in Germany. So when he died in, in the 1850s, he thought his whole uh, legacy was gone, uh, really. Um, and, uh, but then it's, it's cropped up in America. People like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, Le Corbusier, also, also in Europe, and uh, uh, many, many arch architects, designers, and artists uh, were influenced by it. Um, so the, this, um, this is a bit of a meandering thing, but I'm bringing it back now to the, the work in, in the space. Um, and we can talk, uh, people have questions about what I've just kind of, the journey I've gone on with, with this uh, background. I can, um, I, I can sort of go into more detail. But uh, this is uh, underpinning some of the, the research uh, I've been doing over the years because I, um, as you will see in the exhibition, I work in a whole uh, range of media uh, and often work simultaneously uh, at multiple uh, with multiple media at the same time. So um, my, my studio in, in Denmark, uh, my studio in, in Norway, is kind of filled with paintings, drawings, sculptures, then I'm video editing, making photographs, so all of these things are, are happening simultaneously. So the video you'll see in, in Gallery 4 uh, would be rendering while I might be making a, a series of paintings um, and then I'll kind of come back to that and it'll influence what I've been doing. So it's also the same with how I approach exhibitions in that each exhibition in a sort of uh, kind of organic way is influencing uh, other exhibitions. So I pick up things in the Freudel studio that then I utilize in, in uh, this non-interactive uh, or less interactive work uh, in Nextdoor. 
and then I do things in this which then sort of feed into, into the other works. Um, uh, play is a, a fundamental part of my practice. Uh, it gets, a, I think, a, a lot of bad uh, pressing in current society. It's seen as a kind of very facile thing, or you know, we're we're all supposed to be working. You know, we're not supposed to be playing, um, and, we're, and we're all supposed to be engo engaged in different things uh, rather than uh, having this sort of uh, free space. I also think things like boredom get uh, bad press, even though the word sounds uh, negative, but actually in, in German it's uh, Langeweile, which uh, means essentially long time. And that sort of idea of stretching out time is what I'm, I'm interested in. I want to, to find the, the spaces um, of, within uh, uh, a process or spaces between different ideas, um, uh, people like uh, Charles Darwin used to, uh, to go on walks, they had kind of particular walks, and that was kind of a, a way of opening up this um, space of, of thought. Uh, this, even this uh, uh, thing that apparently Albert Einstein, uh, when he was trying to figure out the theory of relativity, he was, um, had been working on it for many years, and then he slept, uh, uh, sort of thought very hard one night, and then uh, had a very long sleep, and the next morning he woke up and came up with E equals mc squared. So um, the, the, it's these type of spaces that I'm interested in, and often a lot of the, the things uh, for me have happened uh, uh, since becoming a, a father uh, in, in 2005, because it's brought me back to my childhood growing up in Donegal, and the um, these kind of creative, imaginative spaces, but I've also ended up being more of an assistant to my kids. So they're sort of saying, we want to build a tree house here, we want to do this here, and then they're, they're um, kind of creating spaces for me to, in a way, not be thinking, but also um, have moments of reflection uh, within that. Um, just to be sort of concrete about the, what's on display in, in the show, and, and to kind of place it in context about what I've been saying, uh, the first piece you encounter as you come in uh, to, to the reception there is a piece that's called uh, Forest, and um, it's a piece I've been adding to. Uh, I think the first time uh, I did, did the, the first version of it was in um, in 2006, and I've been adding to over over the last uh, ten or so years, and um, it's a, a series of images of trees. So I make these drawings uh, of, of trees. Sometimes they're drawn directly onto the gallery wall of charcoal, and it's sort of more sculptural, where the charcoal sort of falls down into a pile onto the, onto the floor. Other times they're on, on paper uh, like this. Um, and uh, then sometimes they're quite small, other times they're, they're epic, sort of seven or eight meters tall. And uh, these, these trees, I wanted to place them in a kind of uh, in, in a sort of singular image, uh, so that uh, that um, essentially you have uh, you know one image of a tree, but which is made up by multiple images. So it's both encyclopedic, uh, so it sort of shows the multiplicity of our idea of, of, of a tree, but then also that it's a singular a singular thing, um, and it is kind of the starting point for these these works in here because. Um, I've evolved a, a way of working over the last number of years. Uh, the first drawings have been in, in charcoal, uh, charcoal on, on paper or, as I said, on the wall. But more recently I've been experimenting with using um, acrylic ink uh, and airbrush. Um, so essentially these works are, are working with, uh, with airbrush. So if, if people are unfamiliar, it's, it's not a spray gun, it's, a, it's quite small looks like a, a dentist instrument or something for drilling in your teeth. A uh, small instrument uh, where you have the inkwell at the top and you can get a very, very fine line. It, was, it came into, uh, into a lot of use in an artistic sense in, in the 1960s and 70s with, within the context of hyperrealism or photorealism. A lot of the American and European photorealists used, um, used airbrush. And, um, one of the reasons I'm interested in it is, and it came from this initial animation in the, in the reception area, is um, I'm interested in kind of 
exploring certain um, other themes uh, around kind of psychology. Um, so these works are based uh, in part on a study that was done in the, in the 1950s, um, uh, 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 which was um, done in, in Berkeley in the 1950s. Uh, by a group of psychologists trying to find the, um, the origins of creativity. And I did an exhibition in San Francisco uh, last September, which um, kind of uh, directly engaged with, they, they analyzed 10 world famous architects at the time over a weekend. And that study led me to another study, which was also done in the 1950s, or a test that was a, a established in the 1950s, which is called the Baum test, or the tree test. And that is a, a test where, I mean, I've never been to a psychologist, but maybe I'll try it one day. But uh, apparently what you do is you uh, go to your psychologist and if, you, if he or she thinks that you should have a tree test, um, you get a sheet of A4 paper and you have to draw a tree. Um, and then from that drawing of the tree, the psychologist is able to dis discern your mental state in terms of like, if the tree, if the tree has brown leaves on the branches, or how broad the leaves are, and various different different things. So I was interested in this idea and how it also related to the ink blood test or the Rorschach test. Um, so these trees, what I've done, apart from this one, all the the other um, four uh, works in this exhibition, uh, what I've done is I've mirrored them. Uh, so. Uh, in Photoshop before I make the drawing where I'm working from a uh, drawing, uh, like a photocopy printout or whatever uh, drawing, um, I, uh, I mirror the, the tree. But then through the process, um, that mirroring is um, kind of uh, concealed in a way because, of course, I can't get it exactly the same on either side so that there is this kind of process of trying to create the, the same thing on both sides, which ends up creating a tree which is probably similar to the tree that I started off with in the first place. <laughs> um, so it's a kind of a weird, uh, weird process and maybe maybe I could get a psychologist to, to look at <laughs> <laughs> these trees and find out what my mental state is. Um, <clears throat> but the other, other thing that, um, uh, and a lot of the reason why I was talking about this idea of play, idea of boredom, idea of interest in the origins of creativity, of working with my children and so on, is that that is the way I approach my process. Uh, it seems like uh, very much a conceptual practice and I think a lot of the time uh, people um, uh, see it as that or, or, or at least interpret that. And of course it is, there is a kind of a conceptual underpinning to my practice, but it's not always that the concept dictates the medium and then I sort of follow through on that like, like would be in sort of 1960s or 70s conceptualism. Um, it's much more of a, a kind of a fluid process that's constantly evolving. So when I started to bring the um, bring the uh, uh, the actual uh, airbrush into the equation, um, initially it didn't sit right with me because I was thinking, well, you know. Uh, the, the charcoal is made out of dead tree and it's carbon at the end of its the end of its life, uh, or turned into carbon. And conceptually, that works because I'm making a drawing of a tree and so on and so forth. Then the cellulose paper is also a tree, so that works as well with the charcoal. But then I started through other exhibitions realizing that actually carbon is just in, in all things. You know, we're, we're all made out of carbon as, as well. And the, the ink, the acrylic ink that uh, was in the airbrush is also uh, extracted from petroleum from, from the oil industry. So uh, it suddenly started to, to fit and, and, and felt okay to, to use it in combination. Because sometimes the simplest approach for me is the best. That's why I kind of sometimes keep, keep things very simple in relation to the materials I use. But I also was interested in the effect that the, um, and people have, have commented on it already, the effect that it gives with the airbrush because it actually uh, has a consequence of creating this kind of three-dimensional uh, uh, quality to the works but also a blurring to the works. So you have certain areas which are in kind of the sharpness and then other areas that are blurry. And I, I mean, I want my work to be aesthetic. 
I want my work to, uh, you know, for people to be interested in the work uh, as, you know, maybe a beautiful or interesting object and so on. But I also want my work to ask questions. And I am interested in how this blurriness is difficult to kind of locate to so suddenly think, do I need spectacles or what's going on here? And it becomes a kind of like a psychological to and fro in terms of relating to the image and, and so on. Um, so that's that's the kind of how things are, are under underpinning the work in this. Yeah. So um, then then the works uh, the sculptural instal installation next door um, is again looking at carbon in its in its other state in the in the, the wood state uh, and like I said it's referring to uh, uh, Frederick Froebel and crystallography. Um, the interesting thing about crystallography also is that. Um, being an interdisciplinary science, science between the sciences, it's, it is a, a really collaborative science. And um, if you look through the back catalogue of, of scientists who have been involved in research that has contributed to, to Nobel Prizes, you'll find that many have uh, worked within crystallography, but also many women who uh, have uh, been involved in Nobel Prizes have been involved in crystallography. So, so it's, I find it also a really interesting moment because um, for me, it, at, at that point in time, maybe around the, the time of the Enlightenment, and, or uh, close to the Enlightenment at least, there was a kind of compartmentalization of certain things. So you would see something like alchemy as being super important in society, uh, not only to artists, but, but to everybody, and it's now, uh, and it has formed the foundations of, of the world we live in and also the foundations of science, but it's seen as this kind of hocus pocus, religious, ridiculous uh, situation or, or, or practice. Uh, but crystallography could have easily become that as well, and yet it, it has uh, grown into a discipline in its own right, and um, it also has contributed to the research uh, for the, um, the, the found out the the double helix and DNA, uh, um, the idea of DNA. So um, in this installation in here, um, I've done a number of, of uh, works um, of this sort, um, and this is the first time that um, I've actually started to work with uh, larger uh, wooden objects, uh, although the larger machine wooden objects, although most recently in Bergen, um, I did an exhibition where I brought in two uh, uh, fully grown trees into the gallery space and had them in combination with, with these types of sculptures. But these are uh, the largest um, kind of cubes that I've worked with uh, before. Um, and the consequence of that is, it seems like a really simple and subtle thing to talk about, but it's important for me because it actually affects the, the way I work with the objects in the space because it gives me an opportunity to to build up into the space and I was interested in you know using a corner um, I think Richard Serra used to do these kind of lead pieces where you would throw kind of molten lead into, into a corner so I was kind of thinking about this idea of, of using a corner and then building out from that but also to build up to a, a certain extent uh, I haven't quite got to uh, working with the wall yet with these sculpture, but that'll be like another stage. So I take these things in, in, in stages. Um, and you'll see that there's a, a kind of equivalence or a connection between this sculptural piece and the, um, the video piece, because uh, the video piece, um, well, I can talk about that and then come back to the sculpture and then also to the, the other piece in, in Gallery 3. Um, the video piece is, um, uh, entitled um, uh, We Don't Ride on the Railroad, the Railroad Rides on Us, and it's a quote from Walden by Henry Thoreau. And um, it initially, uh, that quote, I think what Thoreau was um, referring to is that when the, the railroad was invented and was uh, uh, sort of set up to traverse America, um, it, um, it, it meant that in order to um, to ride on the railroad, you had to you had to work to earn your money, unless of course you had lots of money. But you had to work to earn your money in order to have the time 
to have recreation. You know, so, so there's a lot of things that are set up and set in motion, like yeah, Yosemite National Park is sort of set, and other national parks are set up as a kind of a point of destination, uh, so that people would have a reason to go on the, on the train, rather than, than it's being the other way around or something. That, uh, so, so these kind of, there's a certain paradoxes in that. But what I'm doing with the, the quote is I'm, I'm interpreting it in, um, in another way. Um, uh, maybe Mr. Thoreau would, would be displeased with that, but, uh, but I, I hope he wouldn't because I think it, it also says a lot more if you take it a bit further and you take it into the contemporary moment because the, the modern age uh, started with, uh, with the, the rail industry, with uh, the use of coal as a, as a means of, of uh, uh, industrializing the world, but also as a means of, of transport. So going back to that time, that's, that's the point where the, essentially the Anthropocene, if people are familiar with the term Anthropocene, which is this moment when um, uh, the, the consequences of what we do on Earth is affecting uh, the ecosystem or the wider ecosystem globally. Um, so, so like uh, CO2 emissions and all these things. So I'm interested in that period when, when the railroad was uh, uh, constructed uh, in America and all, all over the world. Um, I'm also interested in the fact that, you know, this idea of, you know, we're not, we're not actually riding on the railroad, it's riding on us literally. That the, the consequences of, of, of that history of what has happened since that time is actually riding us down because we see uh, or have seen ourselves as separate from nature, as, as not being part of nature, that we're kind of a separate thing that is sort of, but actually it's, uh, it's much more that we're um, all part of one system and we're just as much uh, natural uh, uh, objects or entities or whatever as you know, a stone or a piece of coal or a, a car. That's a whole wider philosophical discussion. Um, but, but I wanted to, to make this uh, piece of work touching on some of these things because what um, is in the film is I've got uh, uh, a dramatized version. There's, there's three audio pieces in, in it which I've uh, taken from, from other sources. And one is a dramatized version of Primo Levi's uh, periodic table, the section on carbon. So it's uh, an actor uh, taking us through that, taking on Primo Levi's uh, role. And it's a very kind of poetic text. And then the other two are by, um, one is by a psychologist, um, and she's uh, based in the US, and she's uh, talking around the, the psychology of climate change. And then the other person is a, a lady who is, is more in, involved in um, looking at capitalism, but how uh, capitalism can um, somehow, and corporations, bigger corporations, somehow can uh, maybe be part of, of the solution. And I've placed these things together with images of uh, a lot of footage I've taken myself uh, on train rides in Germany and Denmark, uh, uh, plane rides across the US, uh, all kind of paradoxically screwed up because I'm actually using the modes of transport that I'm critiquing all the time to <laughs> take, the, to take the, the structure. But this is the kind of paradox that we live in. And also uh, looking at solar energy, looking at other uh, renewable um, energy sources and so on, as well as um, I'm very, very inspired by uh, the Eames film, uh, the, the Power of Ten, which uh, deals with a kind of an idea about looking at the micro and the macro in terms of the universe. Um, so what I've got here in the in the film is electron microscope images of things like asbestos. Uh, things like um, exhaust fumes, the particles that kind of come out of uh, car exhausts, and then out to the wider reaches of, of space, as well as views of cityscapes and so on uh, from above, from, from NASA, uh, uh, NASA images uh, taken by uh, telescopes. And then mixed into that, mixed into that are 3D animations that I've constructed, um, which uh, deal with kind of um, architecture and maybe the things that are, the, the kind of commodities that the, the other the lady is talking about in relation to what corporations are selling to us within a kind of consumerist capitalist world. 
And that piece relates directly back uh, to the sculptural piece, which in a more abstract sense um, it could be evocative uh, of uh, a cityscape. Uh, it could be seen to be like, it was a reviewer who looked at another piece of work that I had at the Norwegian Sculpture Biennale, and she actually thought it looked like uh, the inner workings of a computer, uh, which I find really interesting uh, as well, and uh, that's something that I'm kind of playing with this and we'll, we'll kind of continue to play with. Um, and uh, it also has this kind of micro and macro of, of, of maybe looking at things on a micro level under a microscope. Uh, some of the forms are based on the carbon molecule, as are some of the images in, in, the, um, in the video. And then in between the two spaces, uh, in the smallest gallery, um, uh, are light boxes of, um, uh, well, my home in Denmark. And this sort of brings me full circle to where I started with the, the house I grew up in. Um, I, uh, I studied in, in NCAD in Dublin. And um, I did uh, what's called a joint honours in, in art history and painting. Uh, and my thesis that, that, that I wrote when I was a student there um, for the, the final year was um, an arch architectural history of my parents' house. The house that I was talking about, this Georgian house, uh, I, I wrote this architectural history of it. So it involved going to visit uh, the public records office in the north and in the south and looking at old deeds and testaments and maps and, and so on and doing a lot of research in, into brick thicknesses and window sizes and taxes of windows at different points and it, it, it had to be kind of based on uh, a sociological study to, to start off with then I, I focused on the architecture um, and I also it's a historic house. It's the ancestral home of an American president, James Knox Polk, who is the 11th president of the US. And it's also connected to King James II, who, because he um, had a nice uh, dinner under a sycamore tree on the way to the siege of Derry, he didn't burn it down on the way, the way back. So I won't go into that work because it will take me all day, but uh, I've done a lot of work about, about uh, that uh, particular moment in time as well, which you'll see in some of uh, the, the books in, in the reception. Um, and so what I'm getting to, <laughs> taking a bit of a while getting to, is that in that house, it, it's very steep of history. And it, you know, uh, growing up there, it, it was a wonderful place to grow up, but on the other hand, you're very aware of conservation. Uh, my grandfather was the head of the National Trust for many years, and he was very much involved with, with conservation and uh, bought up a lot of, uh, for the National Trust, bought up a lot of the Northern Irish um, uh, countryside along the coastline uh, to preserve it for the National Trust. So that's why it was whole areas where there aren't golf courses and, and uh, holiday chalets there. So around the sort of, um, uh, Giants Causeway and so on, and um, so he's he's a huge uh, inspiration with me. But one of the the issues I think for me growing up in a, in a house where you're constantly aware of the conservation of it and looking after it is that it kind of tends to weigh down on you in the bits. And and you know as as a teenager, my parents would get me to uh, look after the formal gardens, which would have had full time gardeners running. But we would be trying to <laughs> as, as kids, you know, trying to so you you could spend. Uh, you know the summer months when when everything's growing like crazy. Um, you could spend you know three days cutting with a ride on a lawnmower, a fly mower, a strimmer, and then you'd be finished. And this either like I'm talking seven or eight hour days, and then you'd have to start again to do all that kind of thing. So it was kind of good fun as well. But but one of the things that's really interesting now where I'm living in, in Denmark is that it's kind of there's a bit of that because there's a lot of. Um, Buildings in the in the, the, the place that where I'm living that um, you know I have to restore and look after and, and so on. But actually, for the most part, what I'm doing is I'm involved in a demolition project um, uh, because what what we bought back in, in 2009 is um, is a plant nursery, uh, a plant nursery that had gone bankrupt. So there's uh, about 14 greenhouses, which is about 6,000 square meters of greenhouses. So these greenhouses you see in there and in the video, they're all my home. <laughs> uh, and with uh, Dorlan and Karsten have, have been there before, um, with uh, 
the kind of enormity of that, you can't possibly try to control it. You know, it's, it's something that if you try to control it, it definitely controls you. But my, my view of, of it is that um, essentially it's a long-term uh, project, which in some ways is about uh, entropy in a way, about the kind of the deconstruction of, uh, of material or about the kind of processes of material change and other things. But also it's about kind of managing the return of nature, uh, uh, of, of kind of natural processes and so on. But also, I'm totally intrigued by the opportunities afforded by uh, the different things that I'm affecting. So, one group of the greenhouses, um, I've removed um, all the tables in the, these kind of plastic and aluminium tables, and also begun removing a lot of the glass. And because of that, uh, lots and lots of weeds have started to grow up. Um, but also where there's still the glass in the, in the, in the roofs, um, it stops the uh, chemicals that are used in the farming industry from getting in. So they become these kind of like ecosystems for weeds and for insects. So tons and tons of uh, insects in these spaces. And also the weeds are like growing like uh, crazy. And then the seeds get because there's, there's very little through wind, the seeds just stay where they are, and then they replant themselves again and grow again. So it becomes this kind of strange uh, ecosystem where I'm able to kind of put a view. On the other side, where I haven't removed the tables, um, trees have got in, uh, and you'll see it in some of the light boxes, the trees have got in, uh, in the cracks where the snow has broken the glass and so on. And they have established themselves back in 2009, so they're, they're almost getting to being mature trees now. And they're growing up, but taking the form of the architecture. So if I was to remove the architecture, we'd have these kind of strange uh, V-like trees and lines uh, within them. So I'm sort of fascinated by, by all of these things. I mean, the, the idea is that, uh, you know, if I live long enough, maybe like 20, 30 years, um, it'll just be a forest. So it's not really land art, uh, as, as far as I can see. It doesn't look like any, anything like Spiral Jetty, like Robert Smithson, or, in, or even Nancy Holt, even though there are huge influences in, in my work. Uh, it's, it's much more um, about kind of a process of, of um, uh, returning this uh, industrial site, you know, it's a kind of post-industrial uh, landscape, returning this industrial site in the best possible way, but also documenting the process of that return. So I'm constantly filming and taking photographs. And you know, in the area where I'm doing a lot of work, that's one thing, and I feel like I can move things around. In the other area, I'm just a, a kind of a casual observer in a way, watching all these uh, these things changing. Um, so in what I've got on show in this, uh, this exhibition is a, a series of light boxes uh, of uh, some images that I've, I've taken recently in the greenhouses and then a video piece which I made in the, the first year we took over the place in the, the, the uh, summer autumn of uh, 2009 and into, um, into, the, into 2010. Um, and it's augmented by um, uh, Samuel Beckett text, which is text for nothing, uh, eight, number eight. Um, and I've been using uh, several texts, uh, including Smithson's writings, but uh, other people's writings, as a kind of a touchstone for the, for the work. But I think Beckett's uh, text for nothing are the kind of key text for me, because what I, I like about them is that they're, they're very open, uh, and there's something that um, allow me to sort of contemplate the space uh, spaces that I'm dealing with and take me on sort of poetic journeys within that. Um, but they also um, also uh, kind of uh, don't sort of set up, um, they're you know, sort of existential in a way. The other text which is used for the, the title of the show um, is actually a, a text by Hans Christian Andersen and the the place where I live, uh, Odense in, in Denmark, is his birthplace. Um, so recently, writer uh, Sadie Plant um, wrote a, a text for me, which uh, I, when I was commissioning the text, I asked her 
uh, just to, uh, well, she had kind of free reign in what, what she could do. And what she's done is, is made this beautiful text, which is going to be published in the next year or so in a, in a publication on the project. Um, and she took uh, uh, Hans Christian Andersen's text and almost in a sort of Frankenstein way reconstructed a whole uh, story uh, where plants and animals are kind of talking to each other and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, have I forgotten anything? No, you <laughs> should <laughs> oh, no. no. Yeah, believe how you title that up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. And end it with the title. <laughs> so, any, any questions? Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the relation to architecture and the human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, that, that sort of um, goes back to, I mean, I, I was a bit of a, a daydreamer as a, as a kid, as you can probably tell, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, also as a teenager. And um, I uh, didn't really know what I wanted, wanted to do, but both my parents are artists, I'm the eldest of, of six children. And uh, my parents met at, uh, at our college in Belfast in the late 60s or early 70s. And um, my mother was studying sculpture, my dad was studying painting. So we had sort of art um, kind of occurring all around us. And we grew up sort of being very familiar with the idea of a studio and all these different things. But it wasn't something that was forced upon us. It just was kind of a natural phenomenon. Was, was, was the, the forest was in a way, um, and uh, I uh, went through sort of phases of, of being interested in different things. At one point, I think I I wanted to be in um, Custer's Seventh Cavalry, I don't know, uh, which wouldn't have been a good uh, good idea. Uh, and then another point, I wanted to be um, ar an archaeologist because of Indiana Jones, of course. Um, and then eventually, I. Uh, ended up with architecture. I'm not quite sure why, because it was before all of this um, uh, interest in, the, in researching the house. My father was researching the house uh, as a kind of a local historian, really, in terms of he found out a lot of the, the stuff that I used as basis of the architectural uh, research that I did on the house. Um, but I guess, in a way, looking back on it, you know, like there were certain outbuildings um, that uh, didn't have roofs, so that they had trees growing out of them and so on. So there was kind of like architecture in ruin and architecture in uh, not in ruin, and uh, that maybe was sort of present for me in some way. Um, but anyway, I, I applied to DIT and UCD to do architecture, and I did the aptitude tests for both and everything, and I got in. And I think I, maybe, you're probably not supposed to do this, but I, I think I deferred both of them, deferred entry into both of them, because I got into NCAD as well, to, to the core year. Um, so I deferred entry to sort of kind of keep my options open, but I was thinking of the core year in NCAD as like a gap year to sort of try out lots of different things and then go on and study architecture. But I just loved the core year and NCAD so much that I never looked back, really. Um, so that, that was, uh, you know, so maybe I'm a kind of a failed architect, not a failed architect, I'm a failed not architect, uh, but I, I'm super critical of architects in a, in a way I kind of, I hope there's no architects in the room, I don't really like architects, but uh, it looks it looks like, I like I like some architects of course, I mean I've, I've got friends, some friends are architects, but in general, in general, in general I have a kind of problem with architecture um, because uh, we're uh, recently, uh, or very, very soon, we're at the University in Bergen, we're moving into a new building which is designed by the main architecture firm in, in Norway, Olsenuhetta. They designed the World Trade Memorial, um, Ground Zero Memorial, the new extension to SF MoMA, which is actually a very good uh, extension. But um, there's something about um, the, the kind of the power an architect holds vis-a-vis uh, -vis the power that maybe an artist holds that is, I find quite problematic. Just, I mean, I would say the same about maybe urban planners and about other people as well, maybe in those sort of locations. There's a certain responsibility that is broader than a kind of a, maybe a more local thing. So, just, just a curious, um, like you look at a architects and mm -hmm. you see them within the territories and how involved they are in mm -hmm. running these spaces that have like social enterprises mm -hmm. as, as almost the emphasis of what the, the you know, large 
practice? Yeah, exactly. Would, yeah. You, would you slot your, not, not, not slot your practice within architecture, but certainly the interest in the body and how it relates to it then? Is that your I, I think so, that, that, that would be there, but I, just to maybe clarify it a little bit, um, uh, Le Corbusier could be a good example, but I'm not going to use him because uh, I think somebody who's actually better is um, uh, Victor Gruen. So Victor Gruen, uh, for people who don't know, he was the person who invented the shopping mall. And Victor Gruen was an emigre architect around the same time as uh, Marcel Breuer, Mies van der Rohe, Walter Grobius, all those guys were emigrating from Europe to escape the, some of them to escape the Nazis uh, to America. <clears throat> And he also went over them, and um, he invented the shopping mall as a utopian space. He thought that by bringing the, the street into kind of a circular structure and bringing communities together, that it would bring communities together. That essentially the shopping mall would be this brilliant place where everybody would turn up, they could shop, uh, they could meet each other, there'd be cafes, everything would be, be great. And then uh, he, uh, sort of started designing these and then of course developers took over um, and saw the potential of it and then the whole thing mushroomed out into what we know of the shopping mall today. So then he actually, it's, it's funny because he then retreated back to Germany, the Germany or Austria, and um, he started designing uh, for um, private clients, uh, just houses in the woods. And the same thing happened to the Smithsons uh, in, in in London, I don't know if people know of them. They they did these. Uh, this they're also fantastic uh, uh, architecture in a way, uh, brutalist architecture. But they designed a very controversial uh, uh, building called Robin Hood Gardens in London, which recently, is, or the, the last few years, I can't remember if it's slated for demol demolition now. But they got a lot of bad press, uh, also like Le Corbusier did, where they they were approaching. Um, things from a kind of utopian perspective, um, thinking very much of, of the light, uh, the, the humanistic, uh, uh, you know, thinking of, of people and how they live and so on. But in reality, it didn't it didn't work because this sort of social housing, you know, the lifts broke down, uh, people didn't really feel at home in these spaces and so on. And I, I had a, a conversation back in. I guess it was 2006, I did a show at the, or 2008, a show at the Economist Plaza, uh, which is one of their buildings in, in London. And uh, uh, the, the piece was about them and also about Victor Gruen. The piece was called I Like Shopping Centres and Shopping Centres Like Me. And that's uh, based on the Joseph Boyce uh, seminal work, I Like America and America Likes Me, as well as the whole idea of the shopping centre. Um, but I was saying that Robin Hood Gardens at the, at the time, uh, I didn't get to propose it to anybody. I said Robert Hood Gardens would be perfect for artists. You know, you've got this artist studio uh, problem in, 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 in London where they, you know it's hard to come by artist studios. And artists love equal doses of alienation and social, you know, so, so it would kind of function perfect. And then the light in these buildings is, is fabulous. So the, the, the trouble is that what will happen with somewhere like Robin Hood Gardens is like developers will come in and the architects will come in and will get demolished and get replaced by something that will not will cause more problems than, than even the building itself caused. So I'm, I'm sort of really interested in these kind of dystopias and utopias, but as an artist, I, I don't think, you know, I can't come up with something like uh, uh, Victor Groen that's going to globally change the course of history, you know, by making drawings of trees or sculptures or whatever. I can maybe question those things, but uh, I, uh, I think I sort of see my role as, as maybe challenging some of these uh, these sort of uh, scenarios and, and situations. But also, I'm implicated in all of it as well, somehow just by living and trying to, to live in, in this world. Um, so, that, so it's not as if, I, I think it's also interesting if you look at, say, somebody like Einstein, and coming up with the theory of relativity, and then that uh, him being implicated in the Manhattan Project and the, and the hydrogen bomb coming out of that that study, um, you know, is it his fault? Uh, probably not, but probably yes. You know, it's, it's this kind of utopia, dystopia uh, thing. I don't know if that answers your question. Really yeah. Yeah. But in terms of the other, uh, like I do a lot of um, 
paintings of, of architecture and it's again that balance because I'm not only celebrating some of these ideas and these things and, and also I'm an architecture nerd so it sounds like slightly schizophrenic because it, you know my library is just full of, of architecture books you know so and, it's, and especially modernism but I'm also interested like I read a lot of um, I'm super interested in Frank Lloyd Wright because he was a, a really nasty piece of work but uh, he was also uh, an incredible architect uh, and he was really nasty to the people around him to his family as like a sociopath basically um, I'm sort of really interested in, in uh, maybe the psychology around around these things and uh, the psychology around creativity and, and also yeah, it's, uh, yeah lots of questions <laughs> I think we need to actually close right now because the opening is about to happen. But uh, um, Amy is going to be here for the next few hours. If anyone has any particular questions they want to address to them, we should be happy to have a chat with you. If you wouldn't mind maybe bringing your chairs back and have a glass of wine. But maybe a round of applause for Amy. Uh,